and welcome to the third installation of Crops and Conservation. Um, uh, as I said, just please take our poll. And I'm going to hand everything over to Michael, but before we get started, I just want to say thank you to everybody for being here. I'm so grateful for the technology that allows us to be together and join in this way. And, uh, and I hope that we are able to bring you some helpful information and, uh, and that we generate some good conversation. So I'm going to hand it over to Michael Dick at this point. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Crops and Conservation Series Session 3, Cover Crops and Pollinator Friendly Crops. I'm Michael Dick. I'm the Agricultural Technician with Essex Region Conservation Authority. This is our third webinar in the Crops and Conservation Series. This series is being delivered through a partnership of five Southwestern Ontario Conservation Authorities, Essex Region, Lower Thames Valley, St. Clair Region, Kettle Creek, and Catfish Creek Conservation Authorities. This webinar series is made possible through funding from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. And today's session is being sponsored by the Essex Soil and Crop Improvement Association. This series will explore best practices that will help to improve soil health soil erosion control, and water quality by reducing nutrient loading into Lake Erie. Today you'll hear from three local farmers and an industry representative who will highlight their experience with cover crop planting, their successes, and their challenges. We will begin the session hearing from all of our panelists We will begin the session by hearing by all of our panelists and then we will open up uh, to have your questions answered. You will find the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to ask uh, any of the panelists a question, please type it in the box and press enter to have it posted. And if you like, you could include uh, which panelist you would like to address the question to. Feel free to contact uh, interact with each other uh, in the webinar through the chat box. For any certified crop advisors participating, we will post the QR code so you can receive your CEUs at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you following the session. We have a full lineup today, so let's get right into our presentations. Our first speaker is Chad Quinlan, Quinlan Farms in Essex. Quinlan Farms was started by Walter and Gail Quinlan in the early 1980s. Working along with their parents, sons Donald and Chad developed their passion for farming. Today, they run the farm along with their wives, Kelly and April. Quillen Farms is very much a family farm with three generations working on the farm. Soil health has always been an important part of the farming operation. They started no-till farming in the early 1990s. This was expanded over the years to include cover crops and a more diverse crop rotation. They now plant a large portion of their crops into a living cover crop. Their goal is to limit the amount of synthetic fertilizers used on their farm and to keep soil and nutrients on their land and out of the waterways. Welcome Chad. Good morning everybody. I'll um, share my screen here. Okay, everybody can see that. I hope. Actually, we just see it. Oh, there we go. We see it, Chad. Got it. Okay. I just want to go through today, I guess, to give you a little bit of our journey and what we're doing and where I think we can go in the forward and the future into cover crops and um, put a little bit of a slide together just for talking points for us, for me, uh, going forward. Um, so here you can see just a, a picture, obviously, with some flowers. This is early spring. 
Um, we ended up planning into that. Uh, this is from 2019. Um, you'll see some. You'll see some photos here later on um, of us planning into that and what it looked like. This is from 2019. So we're, you know, early on, um, you know, outside of you know clover underseeded into wheat. Um, you know, we started into, you know, simple mixes of cereal rye, tillage radish after wheat, um, you know, work down the wheat stubble, and then get, get some on it into the fall. Um, you know, some years it'd be a fall killed. Um, some years we allowed to go to spring and then burn it down quickly, um, just so we didn't have too much growth. Um, obviously, we were concerned about that, you know, growth in the spring and dealing with it um, early on. Then we started to step a little bit out of our comfort zone. We started more planting green. Um, we started to mess with uh, interseeding into corn and soybeans. Um, we got out of these one or two blend and went more to a diverse, especially after wheat. Um, felt like we were getting better synergies from multiple species out there than just a couple. Um, and our mixes have contained, you know, pretty much all the standard stuff. Um, that you, you, you'll hear in a cover crop mix. Um, you know, some of the ones we like are, are, are cereal rye, oats. Um, we do like a radish, um, vetch, um, and some of the clovers, uh, you know, we really like. Um, but starting to get out and do sorghum sedan grass and, and some of those more, I guess, facilia, some more of the exotic maybe cover crops than, than the standard stuff. Just some pictures here. Um, you know, this is the first picture. Um, go back. The first picture there is is my twins in in the, what our cover crops look like in the fall after wheat. You know, some good growth there. Um, the next picture, you know, is a is a picture of what it could look like in the spring. This was um, you know pretty heavy annual rye grass. Uh, we had an area that uh, where we spread some out just to see. Um, you know, how to control it and deal with it because annual you know, ryegrass can be very tough to deal with. Um, but we ended up getting a, a good kill and, and, you know, you can see the beans coming through that. You know, some of the things we, we've come up with to, to do some interseeding. Um, oh, geez. Um, you know, this is an old corny tasseler. We, we got our hands on and we put a spreader on the front of it and, and we tried going out into soybeans before leaf drop. Um, and get some cereal rye, trying to get, um, you know, covers established quicker than, than planting after, after soybeans um, with the drill. Um, we've gone back and forth on this. You know, I think if you can predict the weather, this, this system works good if you know it's gonna be a wet fall, um, but we've had just as good success on a normal year going in and planting after and getting uh, established. Um, this is interseeding in the corn, uh, what it looks like right before harvest. Uh, you know, the, right now we're just spreading and, and lightly incorporating it uh, with a rotary hoe. Um, you know, we probably, as we advance, we'll get more into a, a seed disc opener just so we can vary what kind of seed we use, um, get into some of the bigger seeds, uh, your bean, you know, your, your peas or, or faba beans type. Um, get better end fixing uh, in crops. So, so that's some of the, you know, progression as, as we've moved along, something that we, we'd like to change. But as of now, spreading it is, is a, cheap, a cheap way of doing it. Um, so this is kind of where we are now. Uh, we put a, a roller crimper on our, on our planter. Um, and this is 2019, so this was the same field that the first pitcher was in. Um, you know, obviously mostly vetch and rye at this point in time with some clovers on the ground. Uh, we went in and planted into it. Um, this was probably ideal for a crimping standpoint. Um, you know, the biomass crimped over nicely, it was still fairly green. 
Uh, we had a few of the same mix um, that we got actually it was it rained while I was planting this field. Uh, we finished it and then uh, we were probably a week or maybe even further away from the next field. And uh, there was more growth. It was less green. Uh, it was starting to brown off. Um, it became an issue um, with wrapping in our, in our crimper system. I think we are going to pull the crimper off the planter, uh, plant and then crimp after. Um, we think that'll give us, in bigger covers, that'll give us better soil to seed contact and, and uniform planting depth versus trying to plant through the, the mat with the roller on the front of the planter. Um, you know, I, I guess there's different crimper systems out there put on your planter, some are better than others but the better ones are fairly costly. So, um, you know, that's that's where I think we're going with that. Um, you know, our, our goal on our farm is to, to have into the fall, have 100% of our acres covered uh, with something green uh, going into the winter. Um, now that doesn't happen every year, but that is our goal. And with all these heavy covers, uh, we started growing, uh, you know, you start looking at animals and how can you feed that to animals? Um, you know, we're not livestock people or weren't livestock people, I should say. So, you know, we weren't set up to, you know, go grab some cows and, and start grazing cows out here. So we went with something a little quicker as far as getting to maturity or to market weight. And we went with pigs and chickens. Um, you know, we've kind of redesigned our system on that every year. It's a learning process. We'll be in our fourth year with, with pigs, um, third year with chickens. Um, you know, our pigs are now on just a hot wire fence, um, portable fence that we move them around. I'll show some pictures of that later. Um, we started them in um, a portable structure that we moved around daily, uh, which works good on if you want to raise two to four pigs, um, but if you try to scale that up at any any size, I think that's becomes a bit of a restriction. Um, you know, we're trying to mess a little bit with uh, vegetables into to standing covers as well. Um, you know, that's on obviously a smaller scale, uh, you know, to go along with our next point is going direct to the consumer. Um, obviously with the meat, we've done that. So we're just trying to see how many things we can add on to that uh, since we're already, you know, have the consumer on the meat side of things. Um, so here's some pictures, you know, these were the soybeans coming up in that cover crop uh, picture you've seen us rolling. Um, this is the corn, what it looked like. Um, you know, that's what I like to see is good ground cover like that. Um, obviously this year, that year was pretty extreme with how much cover there was, um, but, you know, it, it preserves the moisture well, especially in the hot and um, in the summer. You know, we did some temperature readings in the summer and, uh, you know, there was times we were 10 to 15 degrees cooler than, you know, a work spot um, in the same field. We had uh, some edges of the field that we cleaned up a ditch line and that was work. So we're, you know, not ideal comparison, but we're showing that the cover crop area was quite a bit cooler and, and you know, retaining more moisture. Um, you know, here's some picture. This is a picture of us rolling. This is a picture of a tomato plant, um, you know, that we transplanted into a standing cover that we rolled down. And, you know, here's a picture of our, ho of our hogs out on pasture um, or cover crops, um, a picture of our chicken tractor and, and how we're doing our chickens. Um, you know, we got laying hens too that we're doing in a portable uh, structure that we built or hen house we built. Um, and just another picture of our hogs and, and on the electric fence and, you know, what kind of cover they go into. And if I go back a slide, you can kind of see the, what this is a transition, them going from a spot they were just in to going into new covers. Um, you can see they mat it down, they eat it down, they spread their manure out pretty good. It, it, it's in this system with the more open space, it, it, it works well. Um, 
so wh where are we going next and what's next for us? Uh, you know, obviously we like to add cows. Um, you know, it just it goes on to the, if you're selling pork and chicken to, to a consumer, um, you know, they're going to want beef as well. So how do you, how do you work cows into that and how do you maximize your grazing uh, on the cows? Um, you know, we're really trying to integrate animals into a large cropping area. Um, so you can see here is a kind of a test plot for us. We got, you know, winter kill, you can kind of see the strips. It's not the best picture, but you can kind of see the strips. We've got tillage radishes and stuff that'll winter kill in these strips here. And then we have clovers and things that won't kill here in the winter that are actually greening up now. So what we're gonna do is plant corn, um, probably just popcorn or sweet corn in these rows here. And then we're gonna run our chicken tractors down this alleyway. And that's where, you know, we think we're gonna get the fertilizer for this corn down from the chickens purely. So, you know, we gotta run these chickens somewhere. Uh, so figure out how to, you know, grow crop in with them as well. Um, you know, kind of like utilize your space and your revenue the best you can. Um, you know, I, I think we can even move out of this and go to a bigger scale where we have you know, pigs, maybe uh, some kind of smaller ruminant, you know, sheep or, or, or goats, um, and, and then chickens coming back and be cleaning it up. And maybe that's on a, you know, 30, you know, 12 rows of corn, 12 rows of pasture, 12 rows of corn. And then at the end of the season, you come back through and graze it with, with cows. And then you go back in the following year and plant your, your crop or, or rotate it um, where you have corn where the pasture was and pasture where the corn was and then put it back into a cropping system. So that's something maybe we're working on in the future. Um, you know, we've done a little work at, as you know, you see online guys planting soybeans into ryegrass and crimping it after, um, you know, makes you think we did some of that this year and, and I think it works well. Um, it allows you to plant beans early, uh, allows you to get the benefit from the cover, allows you to uh, then go back in and crimp it down, get the weed suppression and moisture retention uh, when the you know ryegrass hits its heading stage so that you get a kill uh, from the crimping. Uh, plus it roughs up the beans a little bit, which you know maybe tightens up those nodes and, and gets a little yield bump from that. So you know as organic no-till possible when you're when you got animals into the system uh, providing some fertilization, um, you know, can can you get away with it that way? You know, We'd uh, really thinking about compost production and, and what that brings to our operation and our soil health. Uh, that's something we're looking at, you know, on a small scale. Um, 60 inch corn, uh, we're looking at that because if we want to bring cows in, how do we get a, you know, a better forage product uh, from cover crops and corn stalks? Without sacrificing much yield on the corn, there's been some work done on that um, with, some decent success so you know we're going to try that this year and see if we can you know get a similar yield um to that and, and we're also I, I don't have this on here but you know we're working on building data to these systems um you know that's that's where we're at now uh, you, you know soil tests the organic matter infiltration um you know starting to reduce on you know nutrients you know where can we cut back um you know because we're, we're recycling and pulling nutrients from deeper down um you know where can we get away with some of that um what are the animals actually adding it's all that information that we want to want to layer on to 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 this so we have hard data on this um the other thing is uh you know we'd like to add more crops or crop rotation, um, sunflowers being one, um, you know, and winter canola being another. Um, you know, two things that I, I think that we can we can grow down here with decent success. Um, canola obviously has a very 
good end, end user market with ADM being in Windsor and, and having a crush asset that uses a, a lot of canola per day. So, so getting rid of it or selling it or marketing it, which I should say is fairly, is fairly easy. Uh, sunflowers are a little bit tougher. Obviously it's mostly bird seed and feed use um, is a sunflower market. So uh, you got to find a, a customer willing to buy it and, and how much are they looking to buy. But uh, you know, we used to grow sunflowers back probably 25 years ago, um, there's a bit of a market here in Essex County. So, uh, you know, with decent success, so that's something I, I think we could bring back into our rotation. Um, you know, all, all of this, you know, in this presentation seems like it all went well. Um, you know, we've had some, obviously some troubles, you know, our, our planting green um, in 19 was tough. We went into a lot higher of a mat than we wanted to. Uh, the first picture I showed um, with the tractor planting, that field turned out good. Our second field had a little more issues just because of the, the, the you know, it was the end of June. 19 was a was a tough year for being wet. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a little tougher time getting planted um, and, and getting good soil to see contacts. And then it turned dry right after. Um, so the moisture went, went away in the seed trench. Um, so we didn't have his best pollinate or best germination in emerging that field. Um, so it cost us a little bit on yield. Um, so there, there's definitely been, been some failures along the way. We've done some interseeding where, you know, haven't got the rain and, and um, you know, not much come up, you know, not much of a catch. So that's a cost, um, but, you know, I think through all this, we're really starting to see the benefits of it. You know, when we started into this heavy crop rotation, you know, we kind of said we'd give it five years and, you know, and if the system didn't seem like it was working, we'd go back to our old system. And, and um, you know, that was in, I think, 2011, 2010. Um, and we haven't gone back. We've only pushed forward. Um, you know, the big thing I think I'm getting or finding is obviously soil structure has gone a lot better. Um, you know, we're seeing better infiltration um, than we ever have. Um, you know, we're getting out of the mentality that it's colder and wetter in the spring with a cover crop. I, I find it's it's the opposite it, 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 or the same as work ground, it, it, you know, those roots get growing, that plant gets growing, it's it's using up some of that excess moisture we can have in spring. It's warming that soil with its biology. Um, you know, I haven't found where we're really held back at planting time because of recover crops. If anything, it, it provides us with a really mellow seed bed um, that's, that's fairly forgiving. Um, and we don't worry about a crust anymore, um, you know, in our inner cycle. Um, so that that's kind of the, my presentation. Um, we just showed a picture, you know, uh, that's the number one friend on our farm, the worm. Our kids, my kids love digging them up. Um, you know, that's probably one of the biggest things we've seen as we've gone into this cover crop soil health journey is the earthworm's return. Um, you know, we've had farms that we've, we've uh, started farming and uh, you dig a shovel in there, and you find maybe one or no earthworms. And, you know, after, <coughs> excuse me, after a few years, you know, it's quick how quick they return and how, how beneficial they can be. Um, you know, now at our home farms, you know, you put a shovel in the ground and, you know, you're, you're five to 12 of these are coming up in a shovel full. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the big uh, worker in our, our fam in our farm is the earthworm. Um, that's that's the end of my presentation. All right, thank you, Chad. And I think at, at this time I should mention the, uh, to everyone that our panelists today are all from uh, Essex County, uh, and for the most part they are farming uh, fairly heavy clay soils uh flat clay soil so and if that's not the case uh, please let me know
You know, that's right, Michael. We're on heavy clay, bricks and clay um, on all our farms. Um, so you're, you're correct in that. Great. Thanks, Chad. So up next, we have Mark Revest of m &R Farms in Comber. Uh, Mark, together with his wife, Janet, have been farming for 48 years. They produce corn, soybeans, and wheat, and have no-tailed much of their land since 1994. The Revests were the 2008 winners of the Essex County Conservation Farm Award. Mark has been active as a director of the Essex Soil and Crop Improvement Association for many years and currently serves as president of that organization. Welcome, Mark. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Hello? You're good, Mark. I'm good, great. Hey, I farm in the municipality of Lakeshore, the larger than half of Essex County, Brookston Clay. Uh, it is a challenge compared to some, as you'll see my later, what my clay looks like. Uh, can you, uh, Mike, go to a uh, next slide? Yeah, here we are, a trial that the participants of Essex County, a soil and crop, did years ago. It involves a winter cover of rye. The object was to see what the uh, observance in soybean yield would be with these strips. I myself have 40 foot strips uh, triplicated. There's 40 feet of rye, 40 feet of bare ground, and 40 feet. Uh, it was harvested in the fall, uh, burned down in the spring before it got too tall. It was harvested in the fall with a way wagon and on average between the three trials, uh, there was a deficit of two bushels an acre on yield of soybeans, mainly due to because of the uh, cold warm up and uh, in the spring and the no wind or sunshine warming up the ground. Uh, we uh, will keep an eye on this. It was my first uh, for myself and most of Essex County in the earlier days to try cover crops. Next, Mike. Okay, huh. this is a uh, tillage radish after wheat. We injected in digestate. The plan was to get an even injection throughout the whole field of digestate just for nutrients. We had uh, from the a and labs an analysis and the P and K was to be very beneficial. After this injection, we broadcasted with the airflow, uh, the fertilizer mix recommended by our soil sample, and we RTS it in with double rolling arrows. A good rain came, emergence started to happen. As emergence started, all of a sudden we noticed green strips, the paler tillage radish and greener, healthier tillage radish. Upon growth, Watching it all summer. This is November shot. We took a uh, bio weight test of above ground where there was uh, no digestate in the strip in the middle that we found and where there was digestate on the healthier green. There was a big difference in weight. The white flags you see was planted there in November and it was also marked for digestate and non-digestate. The purpose was to see uh, next June in corn what the nitrate levels were in the soil. So upon that happening the next spring, at June emergence, uh, six leaf stage of corn, side dress 28, we, the soil was revealed, the soil nitrogen tests revealed, there was uh, 20, 35 parts per million in the strips where the digestate was, and the strip without was only 10 parts per million. It was recommended by someone that I don't, wouldn't need any nitrogen in this field, but a little skeptical. We, I left the strip with no 28 compared to the normal rate. Come harvest, we had the way wagon in and where there was no nitrogen uh, implied, it was hundred bushels less per acre. There was 210 in the, in the spot with a digestate, only 110. The corn looked like popcorn really. So I'm glad I only left a little strip. It's to prove that the residual N in the ground is not always available. It's a long-term. Uh, that's for that one. Next, next, uh, Mike. Now here's a strip of close-up. Here's a close-up of, uh, here's a close-up of uh, where the no digestate was, uh, very pale and less growth. Next, Mike. 
Okay, and here's a close up of where the uh, digestate was plentiful. The, vegetal, the vegetation was green, great, looks good. Next. Oh, there's a typical radish in November. I uh, likely, yeah, looking, it's a spot where the uh, digestate was put in. Uh, the population was a little heavier in this uh, tillage radish trial. It was the first time I tried it. I would recommend, well, less next time. And that's for that. Next one, Mike. Okay, double cut red clover. It was clipped uh, early in September, I would assume here. And uh, there's regrowth and it's blooming, uh, good for the pollinators. Next one. This is my typical Brooks and Clay. <laughs> and this is what we have to farm in. So you can imagine, these are the roots from the clover. Uh, this is spade rolled over. Uh, <laughs> You can take it from there, what you think uh, we should do, what the results are. This clover was burnt down in the fall, late fall, uh, with a glyphosate and a 2,4-D mix. And a week later, offset an old sunflower, offset this to turn it over, just to have exposure in the spring. Next comes, the next spring, it was just a light RTS and planted it into that nice mulch. Uh, next. Okay, this was another field. Uh, it was uh, then back through glassy. We planted uh, tillage radish, oats, crimson clover, and buckwheat. I don't have a picture here. We did, but we don't have to, sh to show it. But earlier in the cover crop on the, in the front of this program, we just, we just had a nice picture of it. This is in the fall after a good freeze up. This is the residue going into winter. Uh, next. Oh, okay. This is springtime. The residue, the uh, tillage radish and the oats very well decomposed through the winter. The sticks you see is the uh, buckwheat sticks, I believe. Now the crimson clover really shaded out because of the oats and cover crop and the lack of sunshine. And it had it, little survival. I think we see here Little weed, buckwheat, I don't know, it was flea bane, and a little bit of Clemson clover. In the spring, all these little holes were around. One shot on RTS, and it was, although it delayed another disadvantage, it delayed the warm up of the clay. We lost, I had to wait about two, three days to plant corn in here. And uh, in my situation, I used the same 30 inch corn planter, and I dropped inner plants for 15, 15 inch beans. Although there was beans fields ready to plant, I was delayed on waiting for that plant this corn. And so there was a little disadvantage, but no great yield was lost. Maybe it was a benefit waiting for the lands to dry out for the other fields. So that's my story. Uh, I future recommend my good success with 20 pounds of oats and three pounds of radish after wheat. Just a uh, whole sunflower disc worked in the straw and stubble. Uh, airflow with the um, recommended fertilizer mix as a carrier for the seed. Blew it on, one shot RTS, double rolling harrows, one rain, and it's up in six, seven days. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yep. Our next speaker is Henry Donater of Donater Farms in Kingsville. Henry farms with his son, Jeremy. They produce corn, soybeans, and wheat. Henry started farming in 1989 with the help of funding from the Farm Start program. He planted his first no-till crop of soybeans in 1993 and has continued no-tilling since. Henry has been active for many years in the Essex Soil and Crop Improvement Association. After becoming president of the Essex Soil and Crop, he worked his way through the ranks and became the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association president in 2013. Henry has received numerous awards for his innovative work on the farm. This past February, at the Ontario Soil and Crop annual meeting, Henry was honored 
with the Ontario Soil and Crop Soil Champion Award. Welcome, Henry. Thank you, Mike. Uh, can you hear me, Mike? We can yeah, hear you, Henry, but if you can just sit back a little bit, we can just see you from the nose down. There you go. There you How's go. that? Better? Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Mike, you want to just, so this is, uh, this is my um, introduction slide. That is a, a piece of uh, buckwheat growing there. Uh, buckwheat has kind of been my, uh, my crop in the uh, cover crop sector. So uh, Michael, you want to go to the next slide? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to start this off and I'm going to show you this case study. This case study was, uh, those are my numbers, but um, Adam Hayes prepared this for, uh, for another purpose, but it is very, uh, very detailed and up to, up to date. So what we're doing here is looking at the uh, increase in net income and decrease in net income in a, in a cover crop. Now this particular cover crop is buckwheat we are using uh, as for the numbers and we are taking it right to harvest. And you say, well, that's not a cover crop, but buckwheat, even after it is harvested, will still leave the roots in the ground. The roots are still, still have quite, quite a value. But well, you can see when you look across this whole chart there that uh, we've got some in increase and we got decrease, but the actual return on your investment is, is basically minimal because there's a lot of uh, costs in trying to uh, market buckwheat and uh, Chad um, attributed to that, that we have a, a, a problem sometimes trying to get some of the stuff marketed. But anyway, this is a, a 200 acre uh, uh, assembly and uh, basically a three year look at it. Um, we've been trying to include all the costs from harvesting, trucking, drying, because uh, you know, every, just like everything else, they, the buckwheat buyer wants it dry. So it has to be under 14 and that is fairly difficult to do uh, when you're planting it late and even in Essex County. But, Basically, with a $53,000 gross, you probably have a $43,000 cost to get to that uh, stage. And there is, there is some return and 23% return on your investment or $50 an acre really isn't, isn't a lot. You can probably get that with a, a five or 10 bushel uh, crop of double crop soybeans in today's, uh, today's market. Next slide there. So this is a, a close-up shot of, uh, of buckwheat. You can see the little um, little seeds growing there. Uh, it's a really fast, uh, fast growing crop, um, which is what's nice. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, the whole idea of the cover crop, it's not the, uh, it's not the keeping the green on the, on the field but it is also you like to have something that's maybe pleasing to the eye. And in this case, the biggest contribution is it's pollinator friendly. Um, bees love, uh, love buckwheat. And that is one of the things that we've done. We uh, try to uh, deal with other farmers, uh, bring bees into the, uh, into the field and uh, pollinate uh, our buckwheat. Again, next slide. This is again is, is a, a, just a general picture of, uh, of buckwheat. Um, it's growing. Uh, basically after planting, you can expect to see it starting to, start to come through and flower in about 10 days. Next. So <clears throat> again, this is uh, a lot of our fields have uh, grass edges. Um, there's buckwheat growing, flowering. Um, we've got uh, beehives brought in. Uh, basically, you need about a beehive to an acre. Next, Michael. So there you can see, uh, you know, there we have uh, the beehives uh, all set up. Uh, quite, a, quite a contingency. And to make it make buckwheat work the best, we found we do take all the straw off and plant directly so 
we can get a, a better growth and a quicker growth. We have no-tilled it through um, straw residue, but we found that uh, we get a lot better uh, stand if we just get rid of the straw and uh, basically sell that off. But bearing in mind, you have to keep that, uh, that dollar value you got for the straw in your back pocket because you need to put that back down. And lots of times, uh, wherever the straw piles were and stuff, we do get a few, a few volunteer weeds, but not a problem. In the next slide. And sometimes you just need a break. So we do generally throw a few uh, sunflowers uh, in there, here and there. But if you're gonna cut the buckwheat, you gotta make sure you go cut them out because uh, they, can be, they can make a mess in the buckwheat. But the whole idea of growing um, a pollinator friendly crop is uh, we're bringing bees in. So we're, we're working with other, uh, other producers, uh, different producers to, uh, to bring bees in. Uh, they, they, they seem to be happy, especially if we, if we give them like a 50 or 100 acre uh, buckwheat field, the, the bees are just alive in there. They just are moving all over the place. And when you walk in there, it's almost noisy. Uh, they uh, do a good job of pollinating. They do, uh, and if it's the weather's right, they will produce a lot of, a lot of honey. Uh, I've talked to, uh, talked to them and, you know, they start off with great expectations, but uh, usually it's, it's a little bit uh, li limiting. But again, uh, that's another, another crop again from the same field. We're getting buckwheat, buckwheat honey. What's the next slide? Uh, the, and the side, uh, aside that, um, we noticed last year when we had a, a piece of buckwheat right next to the house, when the monarch butterfly started to migrate, they, uh, they stopped over for about a week. They, uh, we had a, a, a fence row with a lot of uh, windbreaks and evergreen trees in it, and it was just loaded with monarch butterflies. And this is a, a shot taken one morning. Uh, they're just everywhere. They, uh, they want a place to sit. And they're damp, so they need to dry off. So it's quite a, a photo opportunity. And uh, in all the years that I've been around here, I've never seen that many monarch butterflies. So um, the, the biggest uh, thing that we need to uh, consider, uh, we, we like buckwheat as, as a crop, and we're going on to, into our third year of really intensifying it and using it. Uh, what, what is it going to do? Is it going to help us? I've already shared some financial notes with you. There's not a lot of money into it, but there is a lot of side benefits, you know, and we advertise this as a um, growing a, a cover crop for that is pollinator friendly and uh, buckwheat is pollinator friendly and it doesn't hurt if you're growing a uh, just a basic uh, rye or uh, oats cover crop to throw in uh, some 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 sunflowers. That's a lot of the things that we do. Uh, we uh, <clears throat> we will just get a cheap bag of sunflowers and put them in there. It just adds a little bit of a uh, bit of color, a little bit of beauty to the whole uh, whole uh, field. And let's face it, something that has is eye pleasing definitely gets a lot more attention to than just a green green field. Uh, green is great. I like green too. I like to see it green as, into the winter as much as possible, but uh, that's why we've gone to try and, and perfect the, uh, the buckwheat cropping system uh, just to, uh, to get added value. Uh, yes, when we're all done, that field is desiccated and there's a plus to that because that field is ready to plant no till in again next spring. And that, that is the whole thing. You were trying to maintain a no till system and keep uh, keep all our, uh, our uh, objections uh, working that direction. But uh, in the same token, yeah, we have to go through the later part of the winter with a bare field, but the roots are still in the ground. The roots are, are locking up uh, phosphorus in the uh, soil surface uh, and we're adding some carbon back there. And we're also penetrating the soil and bringing worms back into the uh, into, into the soil, bringing them back to the surface because they're coming up those root channels. Is there any more, Michael? I forget what slides. I think that's pretty well my conclusion there. Uh, 
again, this is a this is definitely a crop that is uh, pollinator friendly, and uh, that's that's where we're going. So I think that's the end of my presentation there. Well, thank you, Henry. So next up we have uh, Emma Epp. Emma is a crop specialist at Agris Cooperative in Stony Point, Ontario. She has been in the business for eight years. Emma has a degree from the University of Guelph and is a CCA. Uh, certified crop advisor and has her 4R nutrient management specialist designation. Uh, she is uh, married with a, a one and a half year old daughter. Uh, Emma's family farms in the Blyswood area and Emma it currently serves as membership coordinator for the 4H in Essex County and as the second vice president of the Essex Soil and Crop Improvement Association. Emma sounds like she's busy. Thank you, Emma. Yes, I am busy. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you to Henry, Mark, and Chad for their discussions. That was very invaluable um, for sure. Um, so I just want to go over sort of how I approach cover crops with someone that's interested in trying and has never done it before. Um, so the steps to starting cover crops. So the first one I want to um, emphasize is building that support network. So that's finding farmers that have um, done it before, before you um, have experiences, they have good experiences and bad experiences that you can learn from. Um, so hearing from Henry and Mark and Chad, um, when, what worked for them and what didn't. Um, they also might know some more information on uh, what equipment works, uh, what works on the clay ground or th versus the sand, um, et cetera. Um, Someone else to have in your toolbox is an agronomic advisor. So I would challenge you a little bit differently than, than a, a fellow farmer would, um, just to quiz you on maybe not the logistics, but what actually works for your farm. Um, what is the, the thing that you're, you're targeting? Are you targeting um, soil health? Are you targeting erosion control? that sort of thing. So finding the right cover crop for your farm and what you're looking to do. Um, the other one would be connecting with research um, specialists. So someone like Ann Verhollen, reaching out to her before you start um, to see if she has anything that she would like to add to the, the decision-making process. Um, so the next thing to do is to start small and to smart eat, to start easy. Um, so don't go every single wheat field if you're doing it after wheat. Um, just maybe start with one field to start and see how you can manage it throughout the year. Um, when you're doing cover crops, um, it's, it's going to take you a whole year to learn a lesson. So that can be a little bit frustrating to some people. Some people like to see the end result right away. Um, so you have to be a little bit patient. Um, you have to not just jump in one year and jump out. You have to give it a few years um, commitment um, and, and go from there. Um, so it's a trial and error process and you have to really adapt um, each year with what you're, what you're doing. And maybe it's just a simple little change, but it can make all the difference. Um, so the next one is figuring, figuring out what works best for you. So that's sort of figuring out your crop mix um, what you're, you're thinking, um, like I was saying, is are you looking for a nitrogen scavenger? Are you doing erosion control or water retention, that sort of thing? So finding out what works best for you and, and not every cover crop works for every soil type. So maybe if you have a field that's half sand and half clay, um, you do a variable rate mix of that sort of thing. So working it, each farm is different in each field as well. Um, and the last piece of advice I give is treat it like a cash crop. Don't just treat it like you're trying to cover the soil, that sort of thing. You want to um, give it, give the crop what it needs. Um, so an example is if we're putting oats and radish on after wheat, um, make sure you add some nitrogen in. Um, you're not going to get the biggest cover if you don't give it some nitrogen and feed the crop. Um, another example would be if you 
um, you can spread it with your fertilizer, but uh, you want to make sure you, you mix it into the soil. Um, we don't always get the greatest spread when you do spread it with a fertilizer. Um, so drilling it in can be a better option as well. Um, so those would be my four uh, things to look at when you're you're starting your cover crop journey. Um, you want to remember what your overall goal is and stick to it year after year. Um, review those goals and make sure that you're um, sticking to it. Um, the one thing that I do use, I thought we would go through is uh, the cover crop tool. Um, so I'm just gonna change my share here and uh, show you the cover crop tool. So if you haven't been to this website, it's M the Midwest Cover Crops Council. Um, you put in where you're farming. So Ontario, we're in Essex County, and then you tell it some of your goals. So let's say we're going to do um, nitrogen scavenger, and I'm gonna add another goal of soil builder. So then I, I click find cover crops. And then you can see a, a list of covers, cover crops come up for you. So we have the goal fulfillment. So four is excellent, three, very good, good, fair. So you can see these top four ones are your, the best options for you. Um, and then you can see when the, the optimal establishment time is. Um, so you can see how that works within your cropping system. So let's say we're planting after wheat, um, winter cereal rye works. Um, and maybe nothing else <laughs> in this uh, example, but there's many different cover crops in, in, this, uh, in this website here. So I'm just gonna click, click on winter cereal, cereal rye. And it, it gives you information. So it gives you location information, um, cover crop selection information, plant information. So this gets into what your optimal seeding depth should be, your seeding rate, if you're drilling it versus broadcasting or aerial seed, seeding, um, and then what your seed count should be and if you can cross seed it, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, a plethora of information here for you. Um, so I really recommend looking into this when you are deciding on what you want to, to work with next. Um, here's some performance and roles. The current traits. And then the potential advantages and disadvantages. So it really has so much information on every single species you can think of. There's, there's mixes in this website as well. Um, so I really do recommend looking at this when, when you're starting your cover crop journey. So that is all I have um, for today. So I just wanted to thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much, Emma. I'm muted. <laughs> thank you to all of our speakers. Um, and, and for those of you who are um, have to leave, um, make sure you take time to for the next sessions, uh, crops and conservation series every Tuesday in March, uh, eleven a.m. to learn more about economics and agricultural BMPs, climate change impacts, and solutions in agriculture through the same uh, Zoom link as today. Um, and at this time, we'll answer some questions. Uh, first, also please um, complete the poll that is on the screen now to let you, uh, to let us know how uh, informative you felt this webinar was. And a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be sent to you by email following the session. Uh, also keep in mind, if you are into this new, new journey of uh, trying out cover crops, uh, you might want to check with your local conservation authority to see if you, there's any uh, incentive funding to help you financially as you get started. So at this time, we're, yeah, we're asking our panelists to um, 
turn their cameras on and to answer any questions. If you wanna ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A box accessible at the bottom of your panel. So Katie, are there any, uh, any questions for the panelists? No, I'm not seeing any questions here in the in the Q&A. So I do encourage you if you've got any questions, we do have a few minutes left if you want to ask um, any of our panelists any questions. Um, and I'll give you a chance to do that. And, and I will just uh, say a personal thank you to each of you for being here and for um, sharing your stories. Henry, what I know, the, the chat sort of blew up when you were showing your photos of the monarch butterflies and the bees and, and people were very excited about that. And I will say, um, I've had the opportunity to, to go to one of Henry's buckwheat fields and he's absolutely right. You can hear it buzzing with the bees. So it's, uh, you know, I, I love this idea of having another crop that is not only allowing um, Henry to have another uh, cash crop, but also uh, getting the bees and the, the honey from it and not just the, the bees from, uh, from the hives that are put out there, but you're also gonna get these native pollinators in as well. So I really appreciate these opportunities where we have these win-win situations where there's multiple gains from these things. Um, I do have a question um, for Mark. What is digestate? Hi, uh, digestate is uh, the decomposing of greenhouse vegetation. It is fermented in large ponds. The gas is collected and used to power diesels, I do believe, to generate electricity in the greenhouse industry. And then once the, uh, all the gas and the fermentation is done, they have to dispose of this liquid somewhere. Therefore, my neighboring pond uh, neighbor was a large brother, was a large pork producer and was out of the pork business. And there's a 400 by 200 pond, very deep, that this digestate is disposed of. So it is high in P and K and uh, we like to use it somehow. We have to return it to the health of the soil to save on nutrients. So. Uh, that's all I could tell you. At one episode, we use a drag link in a neighboring field from the pond to uh, put this digestate on the decaying straw and stubble, and it worked in. And as of now, the nutrient value on soil samples is very high in this field. There's no fertilizer needed. That's amazing. And if you're unfamiliar with Essex County, we have um, a lot of greenhouse operations in Kingsville, Leamington. So, um, so this is a, an opportunity to use a byproduct from our greenhouse um, sector as well. So really uh, interesting to hear that. I didn't know that as well, Mark. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I have a question for Henry. Uh, they want to know where you're marketing the buckwheat. So buck, buckwheat, sometimes you get a market, sometimes you don't. Uh, I don't know, I don't. Are you uh, there, Katie? Yeah, I'm here, yep. Okay, I just, uh, I don't see anything of what I'm, so anyway, uh, we market, uh, we market it through, uh, through a fellow in Eastern Ontario and uh, they, uh, they clean it. Um, this year, some of it went to the Dakotas into bird feed um, and others, other stuff went to Japan for, I believe some kind of a milling process. Uh, we don't always know where it's going to go. That's why we don't bank on it uh, financially because, uh, again, it has to be dry. They're pretty fussy. The buyers usually say, okay, yeah, we're, we'll look at it, but we want to know is it under 14%. Uh, this year, we did have some that actually did make germ, really good germ. So that is coming back to the farm to be planted for this, this summer. So uh, it's like a shotgun approach as far as marketing. You can get lucky, uh, or you uh, you could end up, uh, you know, giving it away to the uh, the geese down the road. And again, if you're not from here, there are there. Jack Miner is um, a, san a bird sanctuary down the road from where Henry is, so he truly does have geese down the road to bring his buckwheat to. <laughs> Uh, I have another question. Is anyone interested in interceding cover crop mixes into cash crops other than red clover in winter wheat? And if so, what mixes are you using? And I've posted that in the chat if you want to read it yourselves. Uh, 
Yeah, we've we've done cereal rye over top of <clears throat> soybeans um, at leaf drop. Um, we've done into corn, um, you know, probably a mix of annual ryegrass, um, you know, a couple clovers, uh, whether that's crinsum, um, you know, a borsum clover, um, you know, with a little bit of radish um, and maybe some kind of, um, you know, forage kale or forage rape. Um, we like kale and ra rape seed. Um, because um, the animals like a big wide leaf. Uh, chickens really like uh, the kale um, and, and so do the pigs. Um, so those are some of the stuff we've used into. We've also used, you know, general seeds as a interseeding mix in corn. Um, we've used that as well. Um, you know, you got to go with annual ryegrass, I think, versus cereal rye. When you're interceding in corn, so I'll probably just get too big or, or not make it with the shading. Annual ryegrass does a better job and when you interseed it. If we were able to seed with a seed disc, um, which we're not set up for right now, you could add in, you know, your Australian winter peas, your faba beans, um, mung beans, or some of the others, um, the bigger seed. Um, seed it crops, um, but you got to get sold seed contact. Um, so we're just going with a smaller seed um, over top um, right now. Would anyone else like to chime in on that question? Okay. I actually, I had a, a question for Chad. I didn't know you had um, livestock grazing in there and I was it's really exciting. I'm not a farmer. So it's, uh, these things are always very informative and interesting for me. Um, what's you, how much livestock do you have? Like, is, is it a key part of your, your farm operation or are you sort of utilizing it just to maximize sort of grazing and incorporating that in? Uh, you, we're slowly getting into it. Um, you know, 30, we're only doing 30 pigs. Um, you know, our chicken numbers probably go up every year. Um, you know, that becomes a little difficult in Ontario, um, but we have become a part of the artisanal chicken program, which allows us to do more than your typical 300 chickens. Um, so, so we've gotten into that program as well. Uh, so we're slowly growing it out. Obviously, if you raise these animals, um, you know, you got to go somewhere with them. Um, you know, our choice was to go direct to the consumer. So, you know, we're building and, and matching our numbers as our, our, you know, as our sales increase yep. with, with the consumer um, and, yes. and what their demand is. So, you know, I guess you could do it and sell it into standard market hogs, um, you know, on the pigs. They're a little bit different um, as far as, um, you know, the meat goes. Uh, compared to a, a standard, you know, barn raised hog, um, just a little bit different in the, the fat content um, and the coloration of the meat is a little darker in color. Um, but other than that, uh, and the flavoring is a little bit different because they're getting and eating different things. So, you know, if you can find a more, not direct to the consumer market, but a, a processor that's willing to buy it based off of that, then, then you know, you could increase probably fairly quicker than, than what we have for sure. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and I don't see any other questions from the audience. Uh, oh, um, sorry, let me just, oh, perfect. We just got to thank you to everybody. Um, I just have, I'll just give you the opportunity if you want to, um, as we close to, if you've got any one last sort of um, piece of advice, particularly having cover crops on heavy clay soils, we know that there's, um, you know, often what we hear from folks is that there's there's a lot of fear for having cover crops in heavy clay soils, that the, the soil won't dry up fast enough, that, um, you know, what, what do we actually grow? So if there's just, if you want to take any last opportunity for a word of advice or, um, you know, your, your biggest challenge with, uh, with using, using cover crops in heavy clay soil, I'd just like to give you the opportunity to do that. You know, uh, I think personally that you got to have some green in the spring um, if you're going to go in 
uh, with cover crops into the fall. That's our personal preference. Um, I think Mark and Henry would probably feel differently, but that's that's our thought. Um, you know, helps dry it out, warm it up quicker. We find if you got something growing, um, you know, and then if you are going to kill it off, make sure that you have the heat um, and warmth, and that it's going to metabolize that chemical and, and get a kill fairly quickly. Uh, versus, you know, trying to get in there early because you're worried about the height, um, and then you got to go back a second time. We've made that mistake. We sprayed early. Um, in some of the harder to kill cover crops, it, we've had to go back in a second time just because they, they fought off the original because it was cold and wet or whatever the reason was. So, you know, that, that's probably the big thing. Um, and I'd say if you want to try stuff, start small. That's what everybody says. And that's what we did. Um, you know, it was a slow process. You know, we're 10 years into it and um, we're still learning stuff every year and trying different stuff every year. So that, that's kind of our advice, I'd say, on it. You can't you can't expect everything to uh, to happen the first year, the second year. Um, the fact that we went to uh, the buckwheat and used that, uh, we had to uh, had to do some experimenting. And I was only going to say that in the last couple of years we finally did get uh, things to start working the way we had really hoped. And one of the things that we found we found it better to take the wheat right off take the straw right off, but then we ran into another problem. We had to make sure that we could spread the chaff because uh, when you're baling straw, you need to, uh, you can't get all that chaff and you can't leave a 40 foot strips of, uh, of chaff in the field. So we spread the, all the chaff, got everything out even evenly. And that took a little bit of engineering, of course, uh, fooling around with uh, uh, straw choppers and different combines uh, we finally did get that uh, perfected, I think, in this last year. And again, next year is another year, so hopefully we will we'll see some success. Okay, uh, I had a comment. Uh, there's a new uh, weed problems, the flea bane these years. Cover crops are a uh, uh, cost thing about clipping the flea bane if it's coming in. So that's sort of a, a discouragement on some cover crops is controlling these uh, new noxious weeds. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, cereal rye does a good job with, uh, with flea bane. Um, at least we found it at our farm, um, especially if you let it go and get it onto the ground. It really help with flea bane control. That's awesome. Great. Thank you all so much.